Welcome to the Analytics Engineering Podcast, featuring conversations with practitioners inventing the future of analytics engineering. On this episode, Tristan and I sit down with Andy Pablo, who is a tenured professor of databaseology at Carnegie Mellon, and currently on leave to build his own company called OtterTune. OtterTune uses AI to figure out all the settings needed to get the best performance out of your database. We wanted to have Andy on the show because he's one of the preeminent minds in databases. Andy is a Mike Stonebreaker disciple and a diehard relational database maximalist. We get to talk about the state of databases today, why there are so many specialized DBs out there, and if we really need so many, why tuning databases is so hard yet important, and how the landscape will evolve over time. At the end, we talk a bit about specialized hardware for databases and imagine how the industry might evolve. I find myself wanting to go search on some massively online course to see if Andy has courses that I can sign up and take online. This could have turned into a conversation about the details of a B-tree index. And I resisted the temptation there, but there's just like, there's so much that all of us who rely on databases every day don't fully understand about the implementation details. And we just trust that the platform is going to basically make the right decisions. And I, I find it fascinating to learn all the details. We, we got into that a little bit. The only other thing I was going to say is that like, it was really funny talking to Andy after a couple of seasons ago and we had Mike Stonebreaker on because they're both clearly peas of a pod. Yeah, the same lineage. No BS. Yeah. Yeah. This is really fun for me because I think there's just so much that goes into the design of these systems that I understood like a fraction of what Andy was talking about when he got into some of the nuts and bolts of it. But you can just see that there's so many decisions and choices that need to be made that makes one database system special. And then again, on the user of the database, like you have, again, a lot of choices you have to make to get it to work and perform the way that you need to for your workload. So it's just this really specialized machinery that I think we're going to see how it, it evolves, whether it'll be simpler in time, easier to use in time, whether we're going to have different unlocks with hardware that will make databases run and be even more performant. But it's just this endless knowledge base. And, and I like that he calls himself a databaseologist because he studies this. Like this is his like passion and career passion for many decades. But it's a fun episode. So without further ado, let's get into it. Andy Pablo, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. You and I have shockingly similar backgrounds, if I can trust your uh, draft Wikipedia page entry. We were born around the same time, and I think you were also born in the Baltimore area. Is that right? Yes, I was actually born in uh, St. Angus Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland. What little town around the area did you grow up in? Uh, so I was originally from Catonsville. Uh, and then oh my moved, gosh, but, that's too funny. And then and then I moved out. My, my family moved out to out the city. Very cool. I grew up north of the city in, in a little place called Hereford. Of course, yes. The thing that was interesting about that to me, it's literally no one listening is going to care about either of those facts about our lives, but you and I kind of went down different tracks. You became a person who builds databases and I became a person who uses databases. And the wonderful thing about databases is that for someone who uses them, you don't really need to care that much about how they're made. And in fact, I mean, it's better I to push, know. I push back on the ladder a little okay, bit. Okay, okay. Yeah. I, I would love to hear you talk more about that. But maybe I had been like a data person for a decade. And I heard a software engineer say to me, well, at some level, databases are just files on disk. And yes. clearly there's like a lot of stuff on top of that. But that kind of broke my brain. I was just like, wait, that must be true. But th then I realized, gosh, I really don't understand all the different layers that are put on top of those files. And like, why do we need those? Anyway, I would love to start the conversation off with you just trying to give us the, and I understand that you probably have an entire course dedicated to this. Yes. But maybe you could just try to give us a, a brief walkthrough of like, what is a database beyond the fact that there are somewhere files on disk? Yeah. So without being too pedantic, I would say there's a database and a database management system. And oftentimes people refer to the database, they really need the database system. Like Postgres, MySQL, those are database systems. So we'll go through each of those. So a database itself is some organized collection of data that's meant to model or represent something in the real world. 
So like a, like a, a, you know, a, a university would have a database of students or classes they take, right? That's modeling the real world of students taking those classes. And a database management system is a sort of category of software that is designed to organize, store, maintain, and protect uh, a, a database. And at its core, yes, underneath the covers, it basically boils down to being a bunch of files on disk, but it's how the database system is designed to get enforce the rules, enforce protections, and allow you to access that data. That's sort of the, the, where the magic comes in. And the reason why I would push back on your statement that like, oh, well, if you're just like a regular developer, you really don't need to know what a database system is doing. Uh, for certain things, yes, but oftentimes, you know, when, when you see performance problems in websites or applications or whatever it is, it's going to be a database system problem. And if you don't understand what the database is trying to do for you, then you're not going to be in a position to make things better. To go one level deeper and like my own personal history and helping me resolve some of my own deep questions about the database world. In the early part of my career, in like the 2000 and shortly thereafter, it felt like, I don't feel like serious companies were using really anything but kind of the, a couple of leading database providers. Like the market was really pretty split between Oracle and, and SQL Server and and maybe like a third and fourth place. For, but, but like really, it's pretty these pretty dominant folks. And then over some time horizon, my perception was that the database world has become more fragmented. And, and fragmented, I don't mean that to, to sound like a negative thing. It's actually- Specialized. Specialized. That's a great way to put it. Um, yeah. There's a lot more databases that do a lot more specialized, focus in specialized workloads. Is that an accurate understanding of the last 20 years? Or in fact, have there always been a ton of specialized databases and I was just never aware of them? I have been had this sort of hypothesis in my head and I think the evidence supports the statement you're making that we are in what, what one could call the golden era of databases, where there's so many different offerings, so many different choices that are specialized or tailored to different application domains, operating environments, uh, and, 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 and problems. And, you know, so I, you know, I, I know a lot of the sort of the older, you know, database academics, you know, I worked with Mike Stonebreaker during my PG, um, and David DeWitt and others. And I've asked them before, like, it seems like there's more systems now, but back in the, like the seventies and eighties, was it with a bunch of systems that was it, was it as just diverse, just as diverse as it is now, just not as, you know, those systems died out. We don't know about them. And the, the, the sense I got from them was that there seems to be way more now, but there's always been a bunch of different databases beyond the sort of the big three. Um, in the eighties, it was, it was Oracle, Ingress, and then like the early eighties and Sybase and Formix, uh, Britain Lee, so a bunch of systems popped up and a bunch of these listeners have never heard of, because again, these things have fizzled out or died out over time. The nineties was a bit of a, I don't say the doldrums, there was activity, but to your point, there was a uh, so calcification around Oracle, DB2. And then Microsoft was getting SQL Server up and running, but you know, former to Sybase were still very big. The big difference I think now versus back then was obviously we have the internet, then we have things like GitHub where you can put out open source projects and people start using them. So that allows systems to get you know traction by getting the hands of as many people as possible. Where you know in the old days, like how do you discover a new database system? You have to have, you have to have a marketing team pushing it, pushing it out there. Now you just download things off GitHub. So that I think that's certainly different. So I think the internet has sort of helped accelerate this proliferation. Now, I don't think it's going to last forever. I think that there are, I mean, for someone who builds database systems or wants to teach people to build database systems, it's kind of ironic when you say, hey, I think there's too many database systems, but there's a lot. I don't know whether the market can potentially sustain so many. I mean, I might be wrong, but I feel like there's been a lot of money, VC money being thrown around and there's a lot of companies being propped up that maybe may, may not survive. But there's always been churn. There's always been, because I mean, there's a lot of money in database systems. It's a huge market. So there's always going to be people trying to build new systems. And uh, databases are an interesting category because it's a critical piece of infrastructure, a critical piece of software where there is a lot of money and people try out new things. Whereas you think of like, if you were like a new company today, say, hey, I'm going to build something to replace Linux, that would be a huge uphill battle and hardly impossible to get traction. So I'm wondering if over time we'll sort of process become like a Linux thing where it's like this platform and this database system that like, it'd be hard to, to replace that. Right. And therefore, these new upstarts or data startups, uh, new projects, we won't see as many come out as, as we see today. But building a database system, at least getting something up and running very quickly, is a much easier task than building a new operating system. Now, doesn't mean you did a, did a good job in that first version you write, but like there's enough tools now that you could build something fairly quickly. 
I feel like we could spend another long time on the like shape of the database systems universe to come. But yeah, I have this uh, side project. It's the database of encyclopedia databases, the databases of databases, dbdb.io. And for this one, this is going back to what I was saying before, I, I wanted to catalog all the new databases that have, have come and gone over the years. And the trend I see from that is like, and I don't know whether, again, if it's just the internet, I can find more databases now than, than in the old days, but there, there's definitely more databases now than there's ever been before. So you've been a student of databases for a long time. You, you mentioned you were kind of a disciple of Mike Stonebreaker. You were also a professor of databaseology. I don't know if you created that word yourself. Yeah, it's not real. It's <laughs> not a real word. The university thinks it's real though, right? Like when they have, <laughs> they have to come to like, like events for like, in, you know, incoming students, whatever, you know, they put name tags. And so there'll, there'll be people from like neurology, ecology, and then they, they, put, they think databaseology is real. So you created your your own field at CMU. Yes. And I've known your work for a while, but uh, Natty, who runs the Solutions Architect team here at DBT Labs, he's a big fan of yours. He describes himself as a former coder monkey, his words, of yours at Brown. And he said, you, you have to get Andy on the show. He's has all these like funny stories, been up to a lot of shenanigans. And I have to say, before we hit recording... You even uh, self-proclaimed that you are a strong personality and people need to opt in to wanting to work with you. I want to hear about one such shenanigans of what happened in Wikipedia back in, let's see, it's uh, 2009. What trouble did you get into? So that was my second year as a PhD student at Brown. You're referring to this project that I started called the Graffiti Project. And I would say it's sort of from a pedagogical standpoint, what I do with my students, I always want them to have sort of the main core research project. And then they, they have, and like, that's what the PhD dissertation is about. But then there's like a side project, like just to expose them to other things. So that was sort of my, you know, the thought was like, oh, I should do a sort of side project in addition to my main database research. And so the graffiti project, the idea was we were going to find, basically build a overlay storage system in the vein of like BitTorrent, where we didn't have to rely on the peers or the cedars always being around. The motiv original motivation for this project was in like 2009, 2008, there was, I found this BBC documentary series from the 1960s about on World War I. And what was significant about it was they actually had interviews with people who were actually in the trenches, right? Obviously, they're all long dead now, but so I really want to sort of see that. And I found a bit torn for it, but the, you know, all the cedars were gone from like a year ago. So I was like, okay, well, is there a way to, to have something like BitTorrent, but if the cedars dis go away, the data is still available. Okay, well, I need to find a place on the internet that can store something. But you know, if you're storing, you know, video files and movies or whatever, like it's not something that Andrade would want to host publicly. So I was like, all right, wait, is there a what's a class of storage or something on the internet we could use where you know we could hide things? And so the original idea was we would build a spider that would just search for open media wiki sites, like so the software running Wikipedia. That had open access, which which MediaWiki has by default, and then we would just store Base64 data in pages with the information, and then the tracker would keep track of it. Here's all the, the URLs where you can store data. So again, that, that was the original idea. I was doing this for a class project with a, a, a master student who was brilliant, really smart guy. When I told the professor what I was doing, my plan was to run the, the, the test experiment like, that would actually put the data out there at the Starbucks across the street from the CS department. And he's like, no, 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 no. What are you doing? Like, it, like you know, it's research. Just do it here from, you know, do it here in the, the department. Put a little tag on, on every page you're storing or data you're storing that says, hey, this is a this is a, pro a project from Brown University, and have a link back to our website with information about it. So I did that. Uh, then, then he also, I think, he advised me to to run it on a Friday in the afternoon because that's when all the the sysadmins would go home and they wouldn't see it until <laughs> Monday or something. So, so like, like the professor was a nice guy, just clearly he was not. I don't know. Uh, I know now what, you know, that was wrong, but this is what he told me. And I'm like, oh, okay, let's do this. So we turned it on on a Friday. By Saturday, I think it was in the grocery store. And I get a call from my PhD advisor. And he's like, yeah, what's this graffiti project? Because I just got a call from the department chair who got a call from the office at the CTO of the university about you're running something and we got to shut it down. So I, so I had to shut it down. I had to send, I think, we try to, with MediaWiki, because it's, it's, you know, it's version controlled, you can't just go delete it unless someone has access to the data. So the data was always still there. So what happened was that we ended up storing the data on somebody at IBM's, like, I you think know, it was an empty MediaWiki site, and they were Brown alumni. So then they contacted the president of the university or the CTO, and they used the magic word damages. So my understanding, Brown lawyered up, 
And they're like, all right, who's, who's this? So we, who's had, we this? had like a serious problem on our hand. Yes. But it, I just, yeah. it's like such a creative way where you're like, ah, oh, I need to create an alternative to BitTorrent. I'm going to co-opt Wikipedia to be the place where I store my my data and, and images. It's kind of a funny creative solution. Yeah, I, and I think it was, I think it's before like S3 or maybe S3 just had just come out. The first distributed database. Yeah, no, I, I wouldn't go that far. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, the full story was on the on the Monday I went in to see the department chair uh, with the other the master student uh, this guy Ning Shi and uh, he wasn't there so we went we went to go to see the director of the master's program because I gotta be honest like if I got kicked out like okay sure Andy got kicked out from PhD program that tracks right that was <laughs> I, I was really upset for my friend because like he was you know international student so if we got kicked out you know he'd have to go home right and he'd lose a lot of money so i was ready to like take full blame of everything and so the professor we saw he was so dour about everything you know i was asking like hey you know you know what's going to happen right like you know are we getting in trouble yada yada and he was just like shook his head he's like i just don't know right he was he was like he made it seem like really bad we're in big trouble and i remember the last thing he said to me was as we were leaving the room was hopefully there won't be any news about this and this just blows over so then I get to my desk and then now I got all my emails from friends saying, hey, you're on the front page of Slashdot. Oh, Jesus. So now for, for historical references, Slashdot was- Wait, that was a big deal in 2009. 2009, being on the front page of Slashdot was, it's like being on the front page of Reddit or Hacker News. It was a big deal. So all my friends say, hey, you're on the front page of, of Slashdot. So I was like, oh shit, now, now it's not good. <laughs> so uh, long story short, I, my friend did not get in trouble. I was on probation for one year. And then they required me to teach, uh, to help teach all incoming PG students like computer science ethics, which basically was like the courses like don't do what Andy did. So yeah, so that was, I was able to brush my, my first brush of the law, but like that was, I, I definitely was scared for my friend there. We never got it published. Now I know there's this thing called IRB, the Institutional Review Board. Like if you're doing human experiments like this, you have to go get it approved by the university. But I didn't know this. And then my, the, the professor never told me to do this. So like, I know now not to do it. Really makes me so nostalgic for like the nascent days of the internet. I mean, 2009 to me, it doesn't seem like that long. It's actually kind it of is. a while yeah. ago. It's, it's a long time before we put captures on everything and, you know, everything had rate limits and it was just like, I don't know, be reasonable. And that, that basically worked for kind of a long time. Yeah. I would say, I, I remember correctly, we had like, we, we still ran the check to see whether the data was still there for like a year or two. We still had like 50% of the data still there after like two years. It was, we, we post an archive paper. We never got it published in a workshop because of the IRB issue, right? It's, you know, it's kind of considered, uh, we, we should have done collecting the data the way we did, but it, it, you know, it works. It's a great story. I'm, I'm glad I asked it. I want to talk a little bit more about some of your more recent work. So you host this really amazing uh, series called the Vaccination Database Talks. But really, it's just a collection of people who are building new database system management systems to come talk about what's new and exciting. If you were to give us like a overview of this is the spark notes, these are the database systems that you should pay attention to that are new and up and coming, which would you point to? Because as we just talked about, there are a lot and it can be overwhelming for people who don't study the space where it's like, well, how, you know, how does a vector database uh, how is that different from a graph database or how is that different yes. from another database? They're all a little bit similar and different too. Like what would be the overview of what do people need to know about database systems today? The vaccination database seminar series, that was obviously during the pandemic and the lockdown. But since I started at CMU, every, from the fall semester, we would always invite people, people building database systems to come give talks about them. The interesting thing about database systems or databases from a sort of academic standpoint is not only am, as a researcher am I competing, and I don't want to use that term, but it, it, you, know, you publish papers, keep with ideas, right? But you're not only competing with other researchers at other universities, and you're competing with you know the big companies, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, but you're also competing with all these different database startups. Uh, they're all doing interesting things, and but they don't maybe publish papers, and so you know in academia we may not be aware of what they're doing. Um, and you know going back to Mike Stonebreaker, one of the things he was very always always good at is understanding what the What's sort of the marketplace and industry looks like, and so in that sort of tradition, I decided to invite people to come give talks about their different database systems. Uh, and then obviously, when the pandemic hit, um, we, we just twisted doing everything over Zoom. And the it was you know it was a way to still stay engaged with the students and, and talk about databases. But the the great thing about the the at least for the Zoom talks is like we are now able to get people that we would would not normally be able to get because in the old days we'd fly them in 
you know, this day or night, give a talk. It's, you know, it was a big deal. Now it's like, you know, hour and a half talk. Uh, we can get people all around the world. So that's been fun. And so the current seminar series that's starting in September 2023 this year is going to be on machine learning for databases or then databases for machine learning. So it's a combination of like, you know, vector databases, people that are integrating ML components inside of databases. And then part of also my own research of like using machine learning to optimize databases. So that's this coming up uh, seminar series. But now to your original question is, okay, how does one understand what's going on? Right? What's, what are some systems that people should, you know, I think people should pay attention to? It's a cop out, but it's oftentimes the answer in, in these kind of questions in databases is it depends, right? Are you, do you care about analytics or do you care about operational workloads, um, transactional workloads? But I would say the just offhand, some of the systems that I think I'm the most excited about that I think are really interesting. Foremost would be the Umbra system out of uh, uh, Technical University of Munich. This is being run by Thomas Neumann, which I think is the, the premier database researcher in the world. So I think mm. that's a really interesting, that's probably the most state-of-the-art system right now. DuckDB is certainly very interesting. And I, I do like how the beyond the academic community, the sort of you know, developers in the real world industry are coalescing around it. And so it's, I think it's going to get a lot better uh, and do a lot of interesting things in, in a short amount of time. I think SplinterDB out of VMware is an inter potential interesting replacement for RocksDB or LevelDB for, uh, in, in, as an embedded storage manager. I don't know how, uh, you know, VMware open source, it's Apache license. I don't know how much the development is still going to happen. Um, cause one of the, the, the lead developers is, I think, starting at Cornell University this year. So that's an interesting project. I don't know, Umbra. Do you, would you mind saying a little bit more about like why it's useful and what kind of problems it solves? So Umbra is, is the successor to an earlier system that Thomas Mullane had built called Hyper. And Hyper was uh, acquired by, uh, I think, Tableau. Oh, that powers their caching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's their in-memory column store that, that can do multi-version concurrent transactions. But the really interesting thing that they do is, uh, I mean, they build everything from scratch. So they developed uh, a, a, a radix tree or, or a try called, called Art that is like, Try, actually make tries tries useful. So instead of using B plus trees, they use art. They have a lot of, this is all hyper stuff. So they a lot of the lessons that got learned out of the hyper project, uh, they've sort of expanded upon in Umbra. And the one thing I was saying is the most interesting aspect about Umbra is the way they do just-in-time code generation or query compilation. So this is the idea of taking a query plan and set up interpreting it, like traversing the, the tree and executing the nodes they will actually transpile it into uh, to executable code. And so now you have this like function call that executes the, the query that's like hard code to do only that query. So it knows the types, it knows the data that you're trying to access. And therefore, there's no there's less conditionals, there's less branching, there's less uh, you know, indirection because you know exactly I'm reading this column at this type of this size and I want to do this. So that that is not a new idea. That goes back to the 1970s. IBM did that first in System R. Then it went out of vogue. Hyper sort of revived it, but single store does this. Our own system, we're building CMU does this. Postgres does this just for like the where clauses using the, L the L L L LLVM. So, um, so Umbra do does this as well. But what's insane about it is everyone else always generates like C code and then they compile that, or they'll generate some kind of DSL or animate language and they compile that. Umbra emits their own like op codes and then they convert that directly to x86 assembly. And then they run, run an assembly. And then while the, while the query is running in the background, they'll then run real LLVM to actually do an optimized compilation of, of the, the assembly they generated. And then once the compilation is done, then they slide that in and replace the, uh, the, the assembly version. So like it's doing background compilation while the query is running, almost like the hotspot, you know, the hotspot thing in, in the, the JVM. Is it mostly for transactional workloads or can it do both since it's like really good at finding the right query pattern? My understanding is that it's meant for your HDAP system, so you can do some transactions, I think, on it, but I think it's meant to do like really fast analytics. Okay. But the other big thing about it too is they in hyper and you know, my own research as well, we were focused on building sort of in-memory systems where you assume that the primary sort of location of the database is in memory. And I actually thought in-memory databases were gonna overtake sort of over, you know, disk-based databases. I thought that was sort of the future, especially with with the the, the persistent memory stuff that Intel was putting out, the Optane uh, drives. That all seems has died out because SSDs have gotten way faster and way cheaper. And so with Umbra, they're thinking about how can I achieve the speeds of an in-memory system, but still be like based on SSDs. And so you sort of design the, the architecture around that. 
So I think that's that's really interesting. In my opinion, that that's the state of our system right now. Hmm. Okay, I'm gonna have to check that out. I want to make a statement, and then I want you to tell me why it's wrong. Yes. Okay. There's this like kind of generic question of like, why isn't there just one database? And my understanding is that this comes down to trade-offs. And because you are making all of these decisions in the design of the system from the file format to how the optimizer works to like just a million different decisions that you can't get one engine to be the best engine for everything. Is that a fair statement? And if so, it would seem to kind of lend itself to like, maybe there are a clear five points or some number of points in the design space that are useful and there don't need to actually be a thousand different data. What are the trade-offs that people are balancing and like how many kind of reasonable points in the design space are actually needed? The most obvious sort of categorization right now would be operational database systems and analytical database systems. So operational systems would be Postgres, MySQL, uh, Mongo, Cockroach, you know, the things that are meant to ingest new information from the outside world. And for those systems, you need transactions, you need fast response times, and you know you have to support you know fine grained updates. And then the other side would be analytical systems. This is what kind of DBT targets: the Snowflakes, the Redshifts, the Exadatas, and those are meant for doing extracting or extrapolating new knowledge, new information from the data you've collected from the operation systems. That sort of seems to be the at a high level. That's the sort of two camps. And if you just if you say that's the only if that's the only two categories you have, there's obvious differences the way you want to implement a system to do operational workloads versus analytical workloads. The most obvious one would be row store versus column store, right? If you st- store the data as co- columns, you can do you know because you can do full scans, right? So my sense is that most of our listeners are going to be pretty familiar with that separation and and the row store column store thing. But like, okay, Postgres is a relational database management system, yes, and it can also pretty effectively handle. GIS data with PostGIS. So like, okay, maybe that's not a category that is like, maybe we don't need GIS database systems that are separate. Like when should Postgres just eat the world? And when do we need like a separate thing? And I think we're also having that question too with vector databases, like can Postgres just service all of the the vector database? We haven't talked to a databaseologist about this. So I I want to hear your answer. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. So I I have very strong opinions. And again, again, full disclosure, my, uh, you know, my PhD advisor, one of them was, was Mike Sturbricker. He built the first relational database system. Like I do fully uh, a, a you know, disciple of Ted Cott. In my opinion, the relational model is the, is the right choice for any, almost every database sort of modeling problem you would have. And the, data, the relational model is flexible enough where you can basically model anything. You can model graphs, you can model p-value stores, vectors. Vectors actually go against the original relational model that Ted Cott proposed in the 1970s because every value had to be scalar. Obviously, the SQL standards expanded to support arrays and JSON types, but like the original idea was that you would not have arrays. But relational model has has evolved over time to remain relevant to modern applications. That, in my opinion, I don't think you would need a specialized system for these different. Um, again, these different other proposals are, I think are, are un- unnecessary. That's not to say we can't learn things from, you know, what has come out of like the object oriented database systems of the '90s or the doc- JSON databases of the 2000s, and SQL and relational model has, has you know, the best ideas of those things and incorporated them, and it's just gotten stronger and stronger. So in my opinion, I don't see anything replacing the relational model in my lifetime. Mm-hmm. And it's sort of like, it goes back to what I was saying to you, Julia, like one plus one equals two, that, that's not changing, right? That's the fundamentals of basic ma- ma- mathematics. I think for most data, the relational model, for, for almost every data, the relational model is clearly the right way to go. I'm trying to like translate what you're saying into into my brain. I want to make sure to like allow you to make the maximalist point that I think you're actually making. Yes. It seems like there's this long continuous line of evolution of the relational models charting back to the the seventies. And continually there are these kind of offshoots from the line where like these databases will handle something that the relational model at the time did not handle. But then SQL and the relational model evolves to handle that thing. And it kind of then gets gobbled back up by the relational database world. Is that true? Yes. And so I think the the big change was the 1980s with the, was one of Stonebreaker's innovations, again, was the, the object relational model. The idea that you could have more complex data types in a relational model database. And that's, I mean, that's, that's the core of what Postgres is today. And that's sort of what, what UDTs or user-defined types is, is part of that. So that, at a logical level, I think, the relational model is the right way to go. And the next question is, okay, well, is a single 
implementation of a relational object relational database system is that the best way for it, best way to do everything. And I would say that it's certainly with the update of the, the new SQL standard in 2023, you know, now they have native support for property graph queries. Uh, they have support for multi-dimensional arrays. Um, so it's just, you know, they're doing more and more. The, the only system where I would think you would not want to use a relational system, it wouldn't take something like Postgres and construe it to be, to store this kind of data, but I think it would be your multi-dimensional arrays. And that's just because the, you know, going back to the row store versus column store, you sort of think of like the execution engine with the row store is sort of designed to go horizontally across data. Uh, whereas the column store is meant to go, you know, scan vertically in columns. But within a, a, a multi-dimensional array, it's sort of this weird multi-dimensional direction. And it's kind of hard to build a system that you take, hit, take a relational system and use that. What for. kind of real world data is best represented in multi-dimensional arrays? As a, a common category would be, I mean, the geospatial stuff you mentioned, a lot of the scientific data looks like this. Anything that's like gridded, so like satellite photos, mm. where now like, like point cloud stuff. Yeah. And you have, so it's like, yeah, you have a satellite image, uh, you have, the time, the dimension reading, the time that the image was taken, the sensor reading, the longitude, latitude coordinates. Again, you can store this like using PostGIS, but it may be the case like a specialized array database would be better for this. But again, you, you can put SQL on top of that. But everything else, you're you're a relational maximalist. Pretty much yes. at this point, yeah. <laughs> I, I, get, I, I just think, I want to bring a vector database because you brought that up. Like, I mean, what is a vector database? At its core, it's, a, it's an index, a specialized index that, that can do approximate nearest neighbor searches, right? Uh, and then, as part of that, you store additional metadata about the, you know, the embedding you're storing, like the, the name of the person or whatever it is. And so at, at its core, it's a, it's a document database with a specialized index. There's no, there's nothing that says you couldn't implement that in a relational database system. And you see this now in ClickHouse has it, Single Store has one. It's, you know, in a year or two, every relational database system is going to have their own, you know, vector index. So I, I don't really see why you need a specialized engine. And this goes back to a long history. Going back to what I was saying before, like these golden era databases where every 10 years there's so many, you know, there's new, new thing crops up and everyone says, oh, all the relational databases are stupid. They're old. They're slow. We don't use SQL. We need a specialized system. And then so there's a bunch of, bunch of money thrown at these new class of systems. But then the moment behold, it turns out, well, people forgot, oh yeah, well, it turns out we don't need a specialized system or we can already do this in a relational data system. And then everyone sort of swings back to, to SQL. So this happens every 10 years. The vector databases are just the next bash people. Make the same place. It seems like it's a process that kind of works, though. Like it, this, if if you look at SQL twenty three, uh, there are things that other systems have. I mean, many other systems have already incorporated, and so the standards making process like takes some time. Yes, and it kind of feeds on the innovation in the ecosystem, and and so you've got a profusion of innovation, and then you kind of have a standards body that kind of brings it all together and says like, okay, let's consolidate around this. Yes, but I, I feel like there is, there's a lot of wasted effort in building things that don't need to be rebuilt over and over again, right? Like, and, you know, to, to build a database from scratch, I mean, I mentioned using like SpinnerDB or RoxyD, like that's been a boon, I think, for some of these systems, because now you, you can build a system around a storage manager and not worry about how to do durability and, and, and keep data persistent on disk. But then I just feel like there's a lot of wasted effort for building things, you know, front ends, parsers, configuration management. All that stuff that, that you need to have a system that people can actually use and to solve real problems. I see that as sort of wasted redundant effort. This October, join data practitioners at Coalesce, the analytics engineering conference hosted by TBT Labs. It's built by data people for data people. Register at coalesce.getdbt.com with the discount code PODCAST23, just for our listeners. That's PODCAST23 with a capital P. We'll see you there. One of the things that I've observed is just databases are really hard, like how to configure it. Obviously, you've observed this too because you're you're building a company around it, Ottertune. And it's like a very different skill set for managing a database from like software developers that are just thinking about application code and you know picking a database and thinking like yes postgres is going to solve my problems but all things break at scale or like weird things happen at scale cuz you hit some weird thing that you you don't imagine and then you have to change some secret parameter that you have to like hit the database twice and and then it starts working. I'd love to hear a little bit more about like why are they so complex? Do you think that they're going to simplify in time? 
like one of the really amazing observations of Snowflake is like, I think they are successful for two reasons. Like one, it's the separation of storage and compute, but also simplicity. It's like, they're pretty simple and people love that. Is that a trend that we're going to see more of or are the like knobs going to always be there because there's different query patterns, different workloads and databases like must be flexible and handle all type of workloads by design? And well, any existing system today that has knobs, a bunch of knobs, those things aren't going away because it would be a major engineering effort to get rid of them. And just to be clear, when we refer to a knob, we mean like a configuration parameter that can change the behavior of the system. And, and you, you want to start tuning for how you think the application is going to use, use the database system or use the database. And so I would say, also, yeah, so I agree with you that Snowflake has done a really good job of hiding a lot of complexity. Now, internally, they've told me they have hundreds of knobs. All right. So the, the problem doesn't go away. Uh, it's just who, who has to deal with it. Um, so I think that the, look, the reason why these knobs exist is because when the, when the database system developer was building the system, you know, at some point, whatever the problem they were working on, they had to make a decision on how to do something, right? How much memory to allocate for a hash table, uh, when to, you know, how long to wait for, for writing out the disk. And rather than putting a pound to find in the source code that is, you know, that's there forever, uh, they, they expose that as a knob because they assume someone else is going to come along at a later point and just know how to set it correctly. But of course, that doesn't always happen. If I was building a new system today, I would try very, very hard to not to expose any knobs. And you're better off spending the engineering effort to try to make the system adaptive to you know, maybe start with a default value. And then over time, do not have any deep machine learning, you know, adjust you know, as, as the query runs or something happens uh, accordingly. But again, that, that's an engineering effort that takes, that's going to take time from adding new features. Um, so again, the knobs are usually the, the, the cop out. So in my own research, we, you know, when I started at Carnegie Mellon, I was trying to think of a sort of a new project to, to work on. Um, and I was looking at, you know, this auto tuning for databases is, is an old problem, it goes back to the 1970s. And I was looking sort of a, a new, I was looking for a different way to approach this problem, applying machine learning, because um, I was at Carnegie Mellon, machine learning is obviously very big there. And we, we, we focus on knobs just because there has been not been a lot of work in this area because it really had not become a problem until the late 2000s or so. Um, and the way the, the major database vendors were trying to solve this is basically have these ad hoc tools or these tools that have these rules like if then else statements in it that based on like the hardware you give it some basic information, it would spit out some parameters. And so we looked at, can we use machine learning to refine this process and try to develop more customized configurations for, for different databases? But then the, the big thing, what I wanted to do was have the tool to learn from the experiences of tuning other databases to, to apply that knowledge to new databases. Whereas like, again, all these tools that the vendors had before, like you tune one database and then you tune the next database and it's like starting from scratch all over again. So that was, that was the original idea of, of Autotune. And then as part of this, we were also trying to figure out a way to get, to be able to do this and get, run these experiments on real world databases without having to have access to the data or the queries. Which again, as a grad student, or it was seemed impossible to get because no company is going to need this. It's an impossible to get, like as a company too, because you just it's very hard to replicate scale when you're starting out yes. and like building an application. Like it's what problems we deal with all the time. It's like you don't know. You kind of just have to like go on the journey and then see where it breaks, which is like not a satisfying plan. If it's on prem, like you can't get anything. How much better is the clever approach versus the naive approach? You were talking about uh, very simple heuristics versus you know machine learning over other similar databases. Like, is it a twenty percent gain or a hundred percent gain or what? Uh, yeah, it's like a two x. So, like, huh. but focusing on Postgres, if you take you take the default configuration that Amazon gives you when you create a new Postgres instance and RDS, they've done some tuning. It's certainly better than the default you get when you you, know, you install Postgres locally. Like, like, if you install Postgres locally, they give you like a hundred twenty. 228 megabytes of RAM. They, they're run, they assume you're running on a small machine. Amazon at least sets that up a little bit better. Uh, but then if you run, uh, there's this website called PG Tune, uh, which is probably the most common thing we, we see in the real world. It's like basically the tools I was saying before. You punch in, I have this many cores, I have this kind of SSD, I'm kind of this workload. And then you think they spit out four or five recommended values for the knobs. Hmm. But if you actually then train a machine learning model, which is what Autotune does to, to understand exactly how the data system's behavior is going to change as you tweak, tweak these knobs, um, and we go beyond the four, I think four or five that PG Tune does. You, you can get for some workloads up to 2x performance improvement. The one thing that surprised me is that we actually see a bigger difference in improvement in Aurora 
uh, for Postgres MySQL than we do for the vanilla stock MySQL Postgres on RDS. And the reason why this is surprising to me is because the way Amazon wrote Aurora is they, they rip up the storage layer of these database systems to replace it with their own proprietary infrastructure. But that means they take away a bunch of knobs that aren't too and nobody tuned. But even then, we're still seeing, on average, I think a 20% improvement over, over RDS databases. It definitely makes a difference. There are real implications for professionals for a lot of the different things that we talked about. There's how should people invest in skills with the the like SQL, SQL maximalist position that you hold. There's the, are we going to need more or fewer DBAs over time if it turns out that there's more auto-tuning? When, when you are in front of a room full of people who work in industry, how do you advise them to dedicate their time and attention? Oftentimes when we talk, this this is with auto-tune and, and at the university, when we talk to developers, they don't know really anything about databases. And a lot of times, if you're in like an early stage startup, you're not going to have a full-time DBA. Uh, and so it's usually like a DevOps model where like whoever set up MySQL Postgres at the last company is responsible for maintaining Postgres <laughs> MySQL at this company, right? And we ask them, like, you know, how do you do this? How do you manage things? Like, oh, you know, see the query ran slow. So I, I just Googled like Postgres is slow and I find a bunch of blog articles and I copy and paste whatever it shows up as Stack Overflow, but they don't know what they're doing. So it's very unfamiliar. I, I, don't, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, yes. I would say uh, we've also tried using ChatGPT, and ChatGPT sometimes says the wrong thing too. So it's, and there's also times too where Stack Overflow is certainly wrong. So I think AutoTune allows people to, it's one less thing you have to worry about in your database system. And that way you can focus on the thing that makes your company, your business or project, whatever it is, distinct and unique. Like nobody's going to care or know that, oh yeah, your Postgres database is running great because you spent a lot of this time optimizing it. Whereas like your application has been suffering, you, you know, you should really be focused on things to help that, you know, is, is your core business, the core, core organization's goals. So I see Autotune as, as sort of taking away that burden from them. And even if the company does have DBAs, oftentimes when we talk to companies, they say, oh, you know, I, I'm an Oracle DBA, but we acquired some company. We, we're now using this product. You know, it's based on Postgres and I don't know about Postgres. So we sort of supplement, you know, part of their, their background maybe they didn't have experience in. But also too, even for people that, that have full-time Postgres DBAs, they're oftentimes not doing the kind of tuning that AutoTune can do. They're doing, they're running, uh, you know, reporting. They're doing using DBT to run, you know, run, run ELT stuff. Uh, they are making sure backups are being maintained. Like there's, are doing application modeling. There's a bunch of other stuff they'd rather be doing than sitting and looking at, you know, why queries are running slow or what the auto backing is running slow in Postgres. So we see this as not replacing DBAs, but allow them to do things that are more sort of substantial or interesting in the day-to-day job. Yeah, I think it's just there's so many layers to any database management system that it's in, it's like an impossibility for someone. You have to dedicate a career to like knowing all of the little nooks and crannies of how to run it really well. And then companies, like you said, don't just have one database. They have multiple databases for different workloads and, and then the, the problem just gets compound. So it's something that, you know, we think about a lot where it's like the specialty around managing a database is really very different than the software development background. And so these things are hard and they're kind of like always evolving too. Yes. People have told us they actually think Amazon changed their database for them. Uh, we've had people tell us that. That's not the case. A lot of the stuff, if you're not running on prem, you run on Amazon and RDS, like that alleviates a lot of things, like the backup stuff. But people really think like Amazon or a, a hosted database service is some magical thing that's going to take care of everything. It's not. You still have to do a bunch of stuff yourself. Yeah, no, that I'm aware of. <laughs> yes. I think it's a good place to wrap. We ask this to all our guests, but looking 10 years out, what do you hope will be true for the data industry? I mean, I hope I'm wrong that there's cons- a major market consolidation for database companies, but we'll see about that. Wait, you don't want there to be consolidation or you do? I don't. I, I, like, I, I, okay. Again, more, okay. more data is the better because they can hire my students. <laughs> and again, a lot of interesting ideas come, come, come to these different companies. And it's, just, it's, it's better for everyone. There's a report from Gartner that says there'll be major consolidation in 2025 because yeah, certainly the VC market is, is tighter these days. So we'll have to see. We can work off track here. But everyone is sort of chasing after that Snowflake IPO. Databricks is going IPO. But it doesn't matter when, not if. So everyone's looking to sort of be the next one. And I don't know whether we, I don't know whether that'll be the case. And I, I don't think the market is, can sustain this money. So, I mean, again, going back to my maximalist position, I don't see SQL being dethroned or relational model being replaced by anything. I have an outstanding bet where someone says, someone told me in Hacker News that they, that the graph database market was going to overtake the, the relational database market in 10 years. So that's, that, that's not going to happen. Yeah. It's looking good for you. <laughs> yes. And I promise if I'm wrong that I'll, I'll, I'll make a shirt that says graph databases are, are the best or something. And I'll, I'll use that as my official university photo until I die. 
I think one of the things we didn't touch on, but I think hardware is going to get really interesting for databases. Hmm. And I don't mean GPUs necessarily or FPGAs, but I think that I think there has to be something else. And I, I don't know what it is that could come along that requires us to ideally rethink how we build database systems. It is very interesting. There's been so much innovation in terms of the, the entire hardware industry. It used to be that most innovation happened at the software layer. And now we've started to develop as an industry capability to push that down to the chip layer. But databases haven't really seemed to make significant, I mean, as far as I'm aware, you tell me if I'm wrong, most database systems are x86. They're like running on main CPUs and aren't taking advantage of ASICs or whatever. There's a long tradition in customized hardware for databases. Go back huh. to the 70s, 80s. They were called database machines. And the problem was back in the day, like by the time you you designed and then fabbed and deployed your specialized hardware, Intel put out something new or Motorola put out something new and any, any gains you had have been replaced by the hardware advancements. And so people are still trying today, trying to build specialized customized hardware for database systems. And I don't think that's the right way to go because if it's just hardware, nobody cares. You have to get it integrated into a database system. But okay, if you're, if you're Snowflake, Databricks, whoever, like why would you take somebody's, like some other company's hardware and have that be the core component of your, your database system? And so the cloud vendors can do this, are doing with the stuff in-house. There's Aqua from Redshift. BigQuery has a in-memory hardware seller for doing the shuffle. But, you know, there hasn't really been a huge uptake in GPU databases or FPGA databases. And I just, I just don't know what the next thing is going to be because a bunch of the projects that I would help are promising at Intel have been scuttled. And so at its core right now, like as of 2023, the way you would design, at least for analytics, an optimized analytical engine, a query execution engine, is the Snowflake design of, of 10 so years ago. And prior to that, it was VectorWise out of CWI, where, where DuckDB came from. So the core ideas are essentially still the same. Some of the Umbra stuff is, is different. I think it's interesting. But like today, a no-lab system is basically a commodity. And there's a project at a Facebook called Meta, called Velox, that is... Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's sort of like a... It's sort of an example or of a you know commodity implementation. So this is one of the things that you're interested in over the next 20 years is is there a hardware story involved that changes everything. Mm. And again, I full disclosure, I put I was a true believer in the persistent memory stuff from Intel. Cuz that you have to fundamentally change the architecture of how you manage memory and organize your system if you have something like Optane, like the persistent the true persistent memory. But that's dead. And so on the computational side, I just don't know what the the next thing is. Now, and so I, I think the next decade is going to be wild and I'm interested to see how things turn out, but I, I don't know what the, I don't, if there's anything sort of fundamentally gr- groundbreaking change, like AMD has a CPU where you get like, what, almost a gig of L3 cache is like 700 megabytes of L3 cache. That's freaking huge. You can do so much with that, but like, do you fundamentally have to rewrite the entire system? I'm not sure about that. I'm interested to see what happens in the next 10 years in that space. And so I'm looking forward to, I guess what I'm looking for is like something new comes out and they can rethink how we design systems. A good place to end it. I I really think you gave people a lot of threads to go pull on on their own. So thank you for coming and joining on the show. It's been a lot of fun having you, Andy. Yeah, thanks, Andy. This has been great. Thanks. The Analytics Engineering Podcast is sponsored by DBT Labs and is hosted by Tristan Handy and myself, Julia Schottenstein. Have comments, questions, or guest suggestions? Email us at podcast at dbtlabs.com. Our producers are Jeff Fox and Dan Poppy. If you enjoy the show, please drop a review or share it with a friend. Thanks for listening.